Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, like Brittany said, my name is Kirsten Bayer, and um, we're going to be going over a guide to website accessibility today. Um, I'm the Assistant Director of Communications here at the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support. Um, I also am a adjunct instructor at Richland Community College. I teach virtually. Um, I've taught virtually since the pandemic, and I have also taught some sections in person or a hybrid component since the pandemic. So very well versed with um, the teaching side of everything that you are doing at your community colleges um, and having teachers be accessible in their virtual learning environments, um, which kind of translates into just the community colleges overall accessibility for their websites. And so I know during these sessions that Brittany and Natasha Allen have been sharing um, a lot of resources and things for you to be compliant upon when you get a civil rights review. Um, and while website accessibility is not necessarily something that your civil rights review would be looking over, it is an, a pertinent component of overall accessibility of your institution. Um, I think website accessibility kind of gets swifted under the rug um, in terms of community colleges. If you don't have the staff or the resources to really dedicate to doing that website overhaul and that just making sure that the website and every single page and every single resource on the website is accessible. It is quite tedious, um, but it is really relevant for the world we live in today. Um, I would say it's been relevant for quite some time, even pre-pandemic, but it's very, the relevancy has elevated since the pandemic, for sure. Um, and your website as an institution is really the front door to your whole community college, but specifically your programs and specifically your CTE programs as well. And so I just want to set the land here today for kind of just some relevancy of why we should be paying attention to having our websites fully accessible. And while the people who are on today, you might not have direct um, control over your website and how accessible it is, you do have either some um, leverage with your uh, department within, like, within your CTE department or with your deans or administrators at your community college to at least put these items in front of them um, and bring it to their attention. So that's what I wanna provide some kind of relevancy on for you today. Um, so are all websites fully accessible? You might think that the answer is yes. That seems kind of um, obvious, but it's not. So the answer is no. In 2020, before the pandemic, 98% of the world's top 1 million websites didn't offer full accessibility for all of the disabilities um, across the spectrum that a person could possess. Um, so 98% of the world's top 1 million websites didn't offer full accessibility um, in 2020. And this was January through March of 2020 is when this study was done. Um, in and less than 2% of the world's top 1 million websites are capitalizing on this market of consumers. So the, these websites that are offering full accessibility, they are minimizing the amount of consumers they're getting to go to their website because there is a whole population of people in our world today that have a disability and aren't able to buy from these websites, buy their products or use their resources or whatever, you know, if they're not fully accessible. So we don't want community colleges in Illinois to be a part of that 98% of websites because we want all students, regardless of if they have a disability, to be able to access the resources, the information, the programs, the contacts on your website as community colleges. Um, nearly 15% of the global citizens, roughly 1 billion people across the world have a disability of some sort. And so we want to be able to reach those people. Um, 3.8 million US adults aged 21 to 64 are blind or have trouble seeing, even with glasses um, or contacts or like some sort of visual aid. Um, more than four, 466 million people worldwide have a hearing disability. 60% of screen reader users feel that web content accessibility is getting worse, which is 
um, very interesting because a screen reader, if you're not familiar with it, is what um, they use to absorb the content on the website for accessibility. And they feel like that the use of the website with a screen reader is getting worse. 71% of website visitors with disabilities will leave a website that's not accessible. Obviously, if they can't get the content, if they can't read it or hear the content, um, then why would they stay on the website, which that's obviously not something we want to be promoting with our community college websites. Um, 815,600 um, WCAG compliance issues among Fortune 100 companies. So that's web content accessibility guidelines. Um, and those are regulated. Uh, and companies without ADA compliant websites are turning down a share of $1.2 trillion in market share. So again, just kind of providing that relevancy, these numbers and these statistics really are impactful for websites and companies that are selling consumers products like tennis shoes or clothes or whatever, but we're selling people and students and education and we're selling them resources and we're selling them this idea that they can have a career path and not just a job. And so that to me is more important than these websites who are selling shoes or uh, clothes or whatever. And so we don't want to be one of the websites that are not accessible for our, like we don't want our community colleges to have that. So is your community college website fully ADA compliant? So universities and colleges must ensure that electronic communications and information technologies are compliant, including websites, email, and web documents are fully accessible to all individuals regardless of a disability. Your content should be accessible to those with visual, auditory, physical, speech, cognitive language, learning, and neurological disabilities. Um, and so what we see a lot with community colleges websites is that while your overall website might have like an ADA compliant component, you have like resources, either PowerPoints or PDFs, or you have um, text, or you have might have like a web page or two where the resources on it aren't uh, meeting that compliance, uh, which is easy to do. Like if you have um, a, a teacher in your institution who highlighted a, um, a document or a resource that they've created in their research or that they've taught to their students and you want to highlight it on your website and you upload it as a PDF or something like that, that teacher might not have been meeting the full um, website content accessibility guidelines standards for that document. And then when you upload on that website, your website becomes not accessible or no longer accessible. So we want to bridge that gap. You see, we want to bridge that gap between reaching all students and connecting with our students, because not only do we want to be able to reach them, but we want to be able to connect them with our current students and new students. And so we can't be minimizing or sweeping under the rug or ignoring the huge population of students that do have a disability. There are four main principles of web accessibility. So most web uh, websites have a CMS system, which is no known as a central management system. I guarantee that your institution has a CMS. Um, here at our center, we use CMS systems like WordPress or Joomla. Um, there's also Squarespace. If you've heard of that, that's a central management system. Um, and then your institution might have their own internal central management system that they use. Um, Typically, web developers will develop the code and create the website in the interface of a CMS system. So you'll have three layers of a website. You have the code, which is the web developers coding the website. Then you have the CMS system, which is just basically a software that goes on top of the code, like a layer. So you, they can, you can directly manage the content on the website without interjecting the layout, design, colors, font um, and just overall look of the website so that way the whole website stays on brand but you can add and delete content and then you have the actual front page of the website which is what us as users see when we go to a website online um, there's also alternative text for images is a principle of web, web accessibility it's a huge one um, closed captioning of any kind and then automatic audio effects are is another principle of web accessibility 
some disabilities and conditions that can affect the way that people use websites and you might not really realize these is obviously visual impairment is one that can affect um, the use of a website, but also hearing impairment, because a lot of websites nowadays, especially community colleges, have videos on the homepage um, or tours or um, things that have audio promoting, like some community colleges have like their social media on their website with threads that have videos on them or things like that. So hearing impairment, um, motor skills or physical disabilities, photosensitive seizures as a disability. So if someone has a disability where they see a photo, excuse me, potentially, depending on the light of the photo, the colors in the photo, they can actually have seizures from seeing those photos. And then cognitive disabilities as well affect the way that people use our websites. There are, there are 10 ways to make your website more accessible, and we've created, or I've created a guide for you for that. Um, so the 10 ways that you can most easily make your website accessible is to make sure your site is keyboard friendly, meaning that someone should be able to access your whole entire website without the use of a mouse. So if they have a physical disability where they're missing um, a, an arm or a hand or a limb or something of that nature, and they don't have the ability to use a mouse, or if they don't have arms at all, they should be able to access your whole entire website, click on any buttons or anything with just the use of the keyboard. And they would do that using the arrows and the keyboard shortcuts. So making sure your site is keyboard friendly, make sure all your content is easily accessible, adding alternative text to any and all images, choosing your colors carefully um, when it comes to photos or presentations that are on your website. Um, typically, your website is going to have all the color-coded brand already on brand for your community college, um, but making sure you stay consistent with that, and then use headers to structure your content correctly. That helps with screen readers, with the use of screen readers. Six is design your forms for accessibility. So any kind of forms that you have on your website, we see a lot of forms on community colleges website. Like you guys are constantly wanting students' information, you know, fill out this form to sign up for this um, CTA. CTE class or um, adult education class or this group or this club or to sign up to be a mentor or to sign up for tutoring or whatever. There's a million forms. So designing all our forms to be accessible as well. Um, don't use tables for anything like um, like tables like you would see in an Excel. A lot of community colleges will use tables for like a calendar of events or um, dates, upcoming dates or something like that. So don't use tables for anything except for tabular data, meaning like a number. So you could use like a table on a website page if you had like dollar amounts or something like that, or students, the table could read like students who are enrolled this semester. If the only thing within the table is numbers, then you can use it. But if the table possesses dates like August 15th, 2024, there will be this event on campus and that's in a table on your website, then screen readers are able to access the knowledge that's within that table. Um, enable resi resizable text that doesn't break your site. Um, so your website should already have a resizable text function of some sort. On all of our websites, we have a uh, widget is what it's known for, accessibility widget, and you can toggle it as a user and then either make the, all the font on the website smaller or bigger if needed. Um, avoid automatic media and navigation. So with the photo um, then seizure disability, um, if you have a video that automatically plays, and this is also for hearing impaired as well, um, if you have a video that automatically plays on plays on your homepage that is actually not accessible. It could potentially startle somebody, especially if they have a neurological disability. Um, so we want our user, we, videos are a great thing for marketing, but we want our users to have to physically go click on the video. We don't want a video automatically playing as soon as your homepage loads. Um, and then create content with all your content with accessibility in mind. I, again, it gets e easily overlooked I'm jumping all over the place. It gets easily overlooked, but um, it is important for our, our students and our teachers and just any user of your website. There are three levels to the website content accessibility guidelines. Um, a is for essential, AA is for ideal support, and AAA is for specialized support. 
And so making sure you're meeting at least the essential requirements for the website content accessibility guidelines is essential for your website accessibility. Um, obviously, we would love for you to be at the specialized support level, um, but the essential level is at a minimum. And that's just doing the things that we're talking about today, like having alternative text, not having videos automatically play, um, having like closed captioning on any kind of videos or anything like that. Those are just basic things that can be easily implemented without having to go to a web developer and do like web coding and things like that. Um, you can do an accessibility assessment. There's a website content accessibility guidelines, comprehensive accessibility assessment that you can actually do on your website. Um, and I have a link to it that I can share with Brittany to share with all of you. And it's basically just an assessment that walks you through, like, these are all the things that you should be checking for on your website in terms of content, global code, your keyboard structure, images, headings, lists, like it, it kind of walks you through like doing your own assessment of your website, which is really nice. In terms of content, you'll want to make sure you always use plain language, make sure that a button and, and or a label element content is unique and descriptive. So any kind of button on your website would need to be unique and descriptive and have that call to action. Use left aligned text for left to right languages and right aligned text for right to left languages, which is important. I know a lot of community colleges are getting, um, we're having like an influx of immigrants and refugees who are speaking different languages and like for ESL instructors and things like that, any kind of resources that they would have on your website or if your website is able to be translated into a different language, um, making sure you have the right, right alignment for that language. Um, a web developer would be able to validate your HTML code um, using a language attribute on the HTML element. Again, a web developer would be able to help you with these items on this slide. This is all for global coding, providing a unique title for each page or view. So when you go to a website and you have like icsps.illinoisstate.edu slash forum for excellence. You know, that's our conference that we have. So each page would have their own unique URL. Um, so that's what it's meaning when we're talking about that. Ensure that viewport zoom is not disabled and you can resize text. Avoid using the autofocus attribute. Allow extending session timeouts. Ensure a linear content flow. A linear content flow just meaning that all of your content is linear. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more whenever we talk about like mobile. There's a couple other things you can do with your keyboard, but since we only have 30 minutes, I'm going to kind of breeze over some of these, but you'll have access to these slides. Here are things that you can do with your images, making sure that all your image elements have an alternate text attribute, um, especially on PowerPoint. PowerPoint automatically does alternative text, but nine times out of 10, it's inaccurate for what the picture is actually describing. And we actually have a professional development session on how to better write alternative text for actually social media posts that we had someone do in the past. Um, and she works at a college in Florida and she specializes in social media, but she did a whole session on writing alternative text for social media and all of her tips and tricks could be contributed to writing alternative text for any images. So even on your website too. Um, and then these are some WCAG headings and controls elements, media, audio, and video elements, and appearance elements. Again, I'm just kind of breezing through these. Um, but these are all just things that you could bring to whoever controls your website. So if it's your marketing department, like you don't necessarily have to know what any of these things mean. But if you bring these slides or these elements to your marketing department, if you're not in charge of your website, then... Um, they can make sure and test these items to make sure that your website is meeting the accessibility uh, needs. For mobile experiences, this is what I meant by linear content. So you wanna remove any kind of horizontal scrolling. So if you have like pictures that horizontally scroll or um, elements that horizontally scroll automatically, you'll wanna eliminate that. If someone has to click a button to horizontally scroll, through pictures and that's okay um, because the screen reader can read that. But you wanna mostly make sure that most of your content is linear. 
Um, and then I want to like allow time for questions because it's 1022. But here are some resources that are linked. And this is actually um, like accessibility standards for tables. So if you do have tables on your website, you could actually consider hiring a professional website accessibility tester. There's an accessibility guide. You can test color combinations to make sure you're meeting that for any kind of color blindness. Um, here's a link of how to validate your HTML. So whoever is in charge of your website at your institution, there's a lot of resources for them to be able to use. And then really quickly, I just wanted to share the um, top 10 ways to meet accessibility, make your website more accessible. And Brittany shared this in the chat, but this is also a great resource for you all that I've created. And it's kind of just a checklist for whoever is in charge of your website at your institution. And they can just simply make sure that all of these items are checked and check it off. So that's kind of a great checklist for website accessibility, 10 ways to make your website more accessible. So Brittany also shared that in the chat and we'll have it on the website for you as well. Are there any questions for me? I kind of fed through that. And you all can feel free to unmute or you can type in the chat, whichever is most convenient for you. This is very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, something to think about. I don't know. Like I like the who, resources. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Who is mm -hmm. on the call? Are you guys administrators or are UCT instructors or? I oversee the marketing for Governor State University. Oh, awesome. Like in an apart in a department, not okay. the overall marketing. So okay. Um, they have these rules, and I think they since put up the little icon now that a lot of websites have. Right, the widget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the widget. Yeah. Um, so we have a dean of nursing at Richland Community College. Oh, Michelle, hi. I I adjunct at Richland. Nice to meet you. I'm just an adjunct though, so I don't I don't know a lot of faculty. That's but. okay. I'm new to Richland. Oh, let me. It just came on in December, but great information. I appreciate it. Of course. Where's Richland? Decatur, Richland. Illinois. Decatur. Oh, okay. Because I was at Prairie State College for many years. And then Clifton, he's also joining us from Decatur too. He said, I asked him earlier in the chat. And he said he's joining us from Decatur. So Lisa, you said you oversee your marketing department. So do you have a direct web developer in that department or? No, so I'm in the um, continuing education department. Okay. And we have a marketing person who I manage. Um, so she has access to a lot of this stuff because yeah. through our major, the top marketing department of the college. Absolutely. So yeah, I, I was I just know. curious to see because a lot of times she's saying, oh, we can't do that. We can't do that. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Each website has Each website has its limitations. Yeah. And I know like we're not sharing this information with you all so you can be the content experts. We're sharing it so you can bring it to the content expert at your institution and make mm -hmm. sure that it's on their radar and that it's relevant to them. Um, because I think living as an abled, able-bodied person, it's easy for us to move throughout the world thinking that, like not thinking of these things, not thinking of how colors, something so simple can impact somebody's ability mm -hmm. to actually digest the information that's on our website or not thinking about how we need to make sure that there's alternative text on a photo. Um, I think, you know, we live in a world that's made for able-bodied people and we, it is part of our job. It is part of our mission, working at community colleges and supporting our students to make the resources and the content accessible to them, whether they have a disability or not, depending on whatever their barriers are. You know, we have all this barrier reduction funding and, and supports for students that 
need childcare or supports for students that need transportation. And we have all these grant dollars that can assist with those things. Um, but what about students who simply just need you to have alternative text on the image on your website, something that's so simple that you could be doing to really meet them where they're at because having disability is a barrier for their life. And so, um, and nobody has, you know, I mean, community colleges very rarely have brochures or flyers or things like that, that they're constantly consistently handing out that students are constantly taking. Most of our marketing nowadays is online. So, and it's only going to continue to be so. On the university level, they're cracking down. That's why we are, okay. we actually have been, we have been fined for infractions and that's what woke us up. Well, I mean, that's not good, but you know, it right. is. To a certain extent, because, <laughs> because you, I mean, like I said, you know, you're living in an able-bodied world and most of the administrators and deans and directors and managers at your institution just, I mean, it's not that they don't want to meet students where they're at with these things. It's just that community colleges are already so under-resourced and just having to make this, you know, put this from the back burner to the front burner. Mm -hmm. Can you share this uh, so I can forward it to my marketing person? Absolutely. Yeah. So Lisa, I'll put in the chat here. Um, mm -hmm. We have, it's IllinoisCivilRights.com. It's a website specific to Illinois and specific to, so for career and tech ed, um, under the Perkins law, we are allowed to do what we call civil rights reviews with the community college system. And it is more of a technical assistance approach to help them when it comes to accessibility, ADA compliance, not only of their facilities, but also of, um, you know, access for students for CTE programs specifically, but we open that up to their broader uh, campus. Um, and so I can put that in the chat for you. And that has some great information on there when it comes to facilities, administrators, students, grievance procedures, non-discrimination notices, and all of the above. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and then Brittany, do you have these slides? If not, I'll get them to you. Yeah, if you yeah I like the resources. That'd be great. And then I will have the recording and the slides um, posted under the technical assistance offerings tab. And then if you go to that forms and resources tab down to resources, you'll have all of the, um, it's those top 10 documents. So you'll have grievance procedures, notice of non-discrimination, and then the web accessibility, which is what we're discussing today. Is this under workforce? Well, yeah, walk them through this again, Brett. So you'll go to this website, Lisa. Oh, yep. Yep. Go to forms and resource and then click down to resources. And then if you scroll down, I mean, we have a whole bunch of things, some mm, okay. Illinois, um, but then those ICSPS civil rights top 10 documents. And then mm. that accessibility is what we're we're discussing today. Okay. And she's going to put the slides from today, like this web accessibility is just that top 10 document mm -hmm. that I already shared, but she'll put the slides there as well. Okay. So it'll be another bullet point right under here. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and for thank this you. discussion. I hope it was helpful. Yeah. You're welcome, Clifton. Mm-hmm. All Appreciate right. it. We'll let you all get back to your day. Kirsten, thank you so much. And uh, I'll share these resources out in a follow-up email for those that attended and registered. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.